Good day, everyone, and welcome to our very first Reconnect Insights webinar on the conference on the future of Europe. Just last week, the EU launched a conference on the future of Europe's online platform set up for EU citizens to debate across borders on shaping the union of tomorrow. The Reconnect project is playing its part by fostering the debate between citizens, experts and the EU on rule of law and democracy in the union. As many of you will know, Reconnect is an EU funded Horizon 2020 research project on reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. Our project's aim is to understand and provide solutions to the recent crises faced by the EU. And so now to help shape the democratic future of Europe, we organize a series of webinars to dissect topics that are pivotal to this future, such as this one on citizen engagement today. We are particularly happy to welcome one of the leading voices on the democratization of the EU, Professor Alberto Alemano. Professor Alemano holds the John Monnet Professorship in EU Law at HEC Paris. He is also the founder of the nonprofit The Good Lobby, with which he spearheads his work bridging academic engagement, social innovation, and public interest. Today, Professor Alemano will share insights from his and James Organ's new book, Citizen Participation in Democratic Europe, presenting new bottom-up innovations of citizen engagement with the EU. These new forms of participation can be constructively linked to shaping the democratic future of Europe. In the Q&A session at the end, you can engage on specific matters surrounding citizen participation or the future of Europe with Professor Alemano. So please feel free to type in any questions at any time in the chat box on the webinar panel. The webinar will be moderated by Paul Blocker. He is a Reconnect partner and associate professor in political sociology at the University of Bologna. He has been closely following the developments of the conference since its outset, particularly with the civil society coalition Citizens Take Over Europe. It is now my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Alemano, and I truly hope that you enjoy this webinar. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Paul. Very nice to see you and to meet the Reconnect community at uh, at large. Um, uh, Paul and I would like to make it this as as interactive as possible. So I don't want to get started by telling you a long, long story. I will try to be uh, brief and short in sharing some reflections on the state of play. Uh, on the Conference on the Future of Europe, and why doing so, building on an edited volume uh, that just came out, uh, titled uh, Citizen Participation in Democratic Europe, What Next for the EU, uh, that I had the pleasure to edit with, with James Organ at the University of Liverpool. We have been working on this book for over uh, four years, uh, so it has been uh, ongoing for, for some time. What does allow us to really follow the preparation uh, to the launch on the conference on the future of Europe. But the book itself doesn't focus on the conference itself. We really try to contextualize the self-proclaimed democratic exercise as um, potentially uh, a catalyst uh, for uh, a potential reform uh, of the existing uh, channels of participation, which already are in the treaties or are foreseen in the institutional architecture of the EU. We are thinking about public consultations by the Commission all the way to the petitions to the European Parliament, complaints to the European Ombudsman, European Citizen Initiative, so forth and so on, but also many other democratic innovations that have not necessarily found their way into the institutional architecture. In here, we're thinking more about participatory budgeting, about citizens' assemblies, uh, which have found some applications at the local, sometimes national level. If you think about uh, Ireland, uh, for instance, and you see this in the UK more and more, although the UK is not necessarily uh, a member of the European Union. But these kind of experiments are also there. They've been used in Belgium. They've been partly institutionalized in the German-speaking community in Belgium, in Brussels itself. Um, so we try to really make sense of all these uh, new democratic innovations that also exist outside of the EU channels. And uh, for the first time, 
we try to bring together practitioners of participation and deliberation uh, with academics who have been studying those uh, democratic innovations. Um, obviously, there's no time here to give you the major insights of the book, uh, but uh, in a nutshell, I can tell you that when looking at the book and trying to find a common thread, as we did in the introduction and in the conclusion, you clearly see that there is a case for looking at uh, citizen participation through a more uh, systematic lens and trying to understand what are the relations existing among those channels of participation, how they link one another. And basically, in order to understand which are the democratic qualities of Europe, we really need to understand uh, what these mechanisms are, how they function, and also, this might be interesting more to Paul than to my own research at the moment, which is the sociological profile of the individuals who regular, on a regular basis engage uh, with the European institution through those participatory channels. And there's very li limited data at the moment on this, on this issue, unfortunately, but the perception we all get is that the communities who send petitions, take part to consultation, register ECIs, tend to be, in average, more educated, uh, more uh, literate on institutional and political issues, and therefore be part of a small and not representative part of a segment of the European population. Probably the petitions are those capable to gather more and more individuals with a bit more, a bit more diversity. So this was my brief introduction on, on the book. Um, I don't know whether, Paul, you want to jump in and perhaps comment these initial um, uh, elements before I jump into the conference on the future of Europe and I give you uh, my understanding of what's going on or what is not yet going on. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of the, on the table in that sense. Thank you so much, Alberto, for this uh, broad uh, set of references to the book. I think it's an extremely timely book. Um, and I think it's also, it's a book full of really inspiring and creative ideas. Um, and th that links it also, I think, to the Conference on the Future of Europe, um, how to situate it uh, within this, what in the book you call uh, a more, a call for a, a more holistic or a systematic approach to democratic reform. And I really appreciate that because I think the, the main message is really uh, democracy, is always in, in, its, in its better working uh, guise, so to speak. It's, it's a set of instruments, it's a set of channels uh, on different levels. So, um, yeah, I would be really interested if you could, in that light, reflect on the, on the Conference of the Future of Europe in a more systematic sense. How should we approach the conference if we also want to look at it as a kind of uh, attempt in a more, more longer term way uh, to reform the EU? in a democratic direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happy, happy to, happy to, to look at the conference through, through this angle, um, uh, this, uh, this attempt at looking at uh, the existing channels of participation or the new ones in a more systematic fashion, because up to now they've been developing in a very scattered fashion and the relationship between them and representative democracy is not very clear. However, we know that the legitimacy of the European actions stem both from representative democracy, meaning the Council, the Parliament and the Commission, but also from participatory input. But this is not necessarily clear or not necessarily in the agenda uh, in the current political uh, discourse. So perhaps let me step back a little bit and, and, and also contextualize this conference on the future of Europe, which is starting with a major delay, more than a year delay, um, into the current political situation. Uh, COVID-19 uh, certainly will go down in history, uh, in European history, as a major catalyst for a different kind of integration. And um, it is impossible uh, that this uh, zeitgeist won't necessarily find its way into the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, this is something that it wasn't necessarily planned uh, when Emmanuel Macron uh, published uh, in, across European newspaper this idea of a, a conference on the future of Europe before the European elections of 2019. Uh, we were one year before uh, COVID arrival. Uh, but then certainly the uh, COVID uh, scenario has changed the expectations uh, that citizens have vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. Uh, I would say both for good and, and for bad, because in a way it has given a great opportunity for the European to show uh, that it has a role to play in situation of transnational cross-boundary risks 
also where competencies are limited, but at the same time, the overall response has been very difficult to be intelligible to the eyes of the European citizens due to the multi-level uh, governance of the European Union, a joint procur procurement of vaccine, but national vaccine program. So how, how do you make sense of, of this? But overall, when you look at the European response to COVID, you clearly see that there has been a pretty prompt answer when it comes to the financial and partly sanitary risk. Uh, but uh, there is this lingering, I would say, uh, democratic crisis, which is, which is there and which the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, will certainly uh, look at. Um, what to say about the conference? Uh, well, it has it has started, uh, and this is not an intergovernmental conference under Article 48 of the treaty. It's not there to review the treaty. It's about uh, tri triggering a preparatory process that might perhaps lead to a revision of the treaty. Very important to mention this from a conceptual standpoint. Uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe is something unusual, unprecedented, is a major listening exercise that the three institutions together are doing. I often say this is like a mega meta consultation on what European citizens expect from Europe, which has no precedent, as, as I said, which has very little methodological foundation because we know very little how it will actually work and play out. We know very little about these goals and the very few things we know have been written in a document uh, which is called the Joint Declaration, which was uh, agreed upon and published only a few weeks ago and which basically give us a sort of sketch, very impressionistic. You clearly see it is the outcome of a political compromise that has been very difficult to hammer down of the last uh, year, very different expectations from the three institutions, very little political appetite among the member states, very few of them have been speaking publicly about the Conference on the Future of Europe, and then this interinstitutional fight which continue to be there among the different representatives of the parliament and and the rest. However, I think we need to set aside all of this, which is really the internal kitchen uh, of European insiders, and trying to see what this possible listening exercise uh, might produce for, for Europe and for the participatory democracy as uh, written in the treaty, at least the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. Uh, what I would like to say here is that uh, to understand what the conference might look like, we need to think about a pyramid. Uh, we have uh, at the bottom of a pyramid this uh, online platform that has just been unveiled a week ago. Uh, at the moment, there are only 5,000 people who took the time to register, which is not the most encouraging point, but it is there, it is up and running. And this platform allows any of us to share ideas, to organize events or to attend an event. So it's the basic amplifier entry point into the conference itself. The platform is moderated and analyzed by both physical and AI powered um, uh, mechanism, and it will generate an automated report that will basically tell uh, decision makers uh, where the conversation is going. So what are the issues uh, most Europeans would like to discuss about. For those of you who already had a look, there are a lot of policy issues already defined, but there is also a residual category called other issues where people might add up. What's, uh, what is gonna happen uh, after that? How this process will feed into the second level of the pyramid? Well, what we expect, but again, the information is very scarce, is that the platform conversations will be defining the agenda for the first ever European citizen panel. The European citizens panel will be the first uh, transnational citizen panel uh, organized by the institutions. There have been a few run by the Bertelsmann uh, Foundation uh, entailing the participation of a few countries. So select citizens randomly selected across uh, countries. We don't know yet how these citizens will be selected, which is a big question in terms of representativeness of the sample. But we know, and there are voices, that uh, there might be a Eurobarometer uh, template. So basically the people who are among the thousand and thousand of people who are um, quizzed by the Eurobarometer might be susceptible to be uh, selected in order to join this European Citizens Assembly. I saw the European movement and the Federalists are actually calling uh, for a different type of selection. They look at uh, the possibility of selecting those uh, among those who have registered on the platform which of, of course raise a major issue of self-selection because the people who are there are people who have an interest 
in which raise a deeper issue. Uh, isn't the Conference on the Future of Europe in the pyramid uh, way I describing to you already pre-bias? Uh, so if you don't believe in European integration, why should you join such an exercise on the first place? I think it's a deep question that it hasn't been addressed uh, yet and it would be very difficult to address in the sense that the platform is clearly um, the institutional expressions. There are the logos of the three institutions. You need to register, you need to accept the terms uh, of, of reference established by this platform. So all of this is new. But clearly, the energy and the dynamic that might stem from this uh, is unprecedented because a possible transnational conversation among the few thousand people who are there now might actually occur because the automatic translation allow a Dutch uh, to talk to an Italian without going through English because Paul could speak in Dutch and I could speak in Italian and we would both speak about a European issues and again this is not happening in our European public sphere and thanks to the platform this is going to occur. I would not overestimate, I, I would not underestimate but not overestimate it either because obviously the big issue is who is going to be uh, on that on that platform. So I described the second level, the citizens' assembly. Uh, what is left is the third level, which is the tip of the pyramid, which would be made of this plenary, a plenary made mainly of political representatives uh, who will be processing and discussing uh, those uh, recommendations coming from the citizens' assembly. But there will be those holding the pen. They will be the only ones that actually will be addressing directly uh, the head of state and government and therefore uh, actually first of all the three institutions and then the head of state and government by basically uh, packaging uh, what this conversation uh, is leading to and there there are a lot of open questions right on on how these uh, uh, three levels uh, from the platform to the citizens panels from the citizens panels to the plenary and from the plenary to the institutions and then to the political level uh, how these different feedback mechanisms will actually work and all of this remains uh, an open question for us and is a very interesting uh, perspective for many researchers trying to figuring out how this pyramid might work in the future. Uh, the overall impression is that the institution themselves haven't necessarily taken uh, major decisions on how this could uh, potentially uh, work in, um, in, in, in practice. So this is the structure. Uh, perhaps uh, um, a final consideration on the balance between the participatory input uh, from the platform and the participatory input from the citizens' assemblies based on the French experience in Belgium and, and, and Ireland. Uh, well, in a way, uh, the overall impression we get is that if the platform input might not necessarily be very representative of society because of this self-selection, only people who have a stake in the EU, might have an interest, might have even an economic interest. I'm already concerned about possible economic interest, you know, lobby groups to use the platform to advance the agenda, might be using this. But then this lack of limited representatives might be somehow compensated, at least methodologically, from a well uh, representative citizens' assemblies made of citizens uh, really coming from all walks of life. So this is methodologically the idea that I see emerging uh, between the two. And final consideration uh, on, the, on the outcome. Uh, it seems that the Commission, at least in his social media conversation, Ursula von der Leyen, already committed to follow the recommendations that will come out of this process, which is a very powerful statement, to the point that he might actually shape his own political agenda during the five years time. And this is also something unprecedented to see that there would be a channel to change the political agenda of a commission and therefore the parliament majority supporting it uh, in order to integrate the input coming from citizens. I find it this fascinating, but obviously question mark, will the parliament and the council follow this? Uh, so at the moment it's only the commission who actually made publicly such a pledge, uh, but this is a major issue that again uh, raises the issue of how this conference on the future of Europe will be used by organized interest uh, which are using not only the traditional use of uh, conveying their interest as stakeholders in policy making but also for the conference on the future of Europe so what if the conference will be hijacked or will be disturbed or bothered 
uh, by economic interest and the usual suspects, in addition to civil society and non-profit organizations uh, and various movements and citizens that will be uh, part of it. So on this note, back to Paul for some comments and reactions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's extremely useful the way you sort of uh, uh, created this pyramid as an, as an image uh, of the Conference of Europe um, uh, on the future of Europe. Um, I think we could tease out also a couple of aspects that uh, when we take a more comparative perspective might come out more clearly, like um, there's the issue of the digital platform, which is um, has potential, surely. I fully agree with you, Alberto, that if there's one thing we need, it is a cross-border public debate on European issues. Um, but it remains, it seems to me, unclear what the final objectives are. Um, it's also, as far as I can tell, unclear whether there will be a bite uh, to this platform. That is, if you put up something, uh, I, I went on the platform, um, it has some resemblance even to Facebook, it seems to me. Um, one wonders which kind of ideas come up as most important, which ones will be priority, how will they actually be selected uh, as important uh, um, matters to be picked up, uh, but also it, it remains unclear what then the follow-up procedure will be. And so, as I said before, uh, it might be useful to think about comparative dimensions, about other processes like the famous uh, um, Icelandic um, uh, experiment, which by the way has been recently uh, re-run uh, in 2019, 2020 with the Deliberative Assembly, uh, Ireland, which just two days ago, uh, two days ago had again an interesting uh, outcome in terms of constitutional change, but the, I mean th those dimensions appear to be largely absent in the current conference on the future of Europe, um, even if the name, in a certain way, recalls uh, the, tw the, 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 the the convention of, of 20 years ago. So, what is your take on that? How problematic is that? That there isn't a clear set of objectives and goals. It, it, it risks becoming just a sort of talking shop or uh, a, an enormous selection of ideas, particularly in the digital platform, an enormous um, input, but it remains mostly that. Isn't that a, a great risk to, uh, to this exercise? I agree, Paul. The risk is is clearly is clearly there, um, and uh, we all uh, observers who have been following uh, European integration and in this participatory attempt at changing a bit the the way in which the EU works and function and responds so have, have noticed already two years ago. So we we all uh, waited to see. My overall take here is that the delay of the conference. Uh, was something positive uh, for the process uh, that will be guiding the collection of input, uh, because certainly this template is more sophisticated, nuanced than it used to be uh, when it was originally uh, flo floating, floated in public debate. Uh, but we are still not there. We still don't know enough about uh, how this, as you said, feedback mechanisms and linkages among these three levels of the pyramids will be, will be working. Um, th there are a lot of question marks, ab absolutely, and, and those are very much linked, uh, trying to address your questions about what we can learn from the national experience and the comparative analysis is the fact that the conditions under which any form of citizens' deliberate assembly should be designed today are uniquely unprecedented, right? It should be, it should combine transnational randomization, uh, something that, again, Bertelsmann have been experimenting a little bit with some countries, but this is a new element multilingualism and also the online uh, connection. Uh, so all these elements render everything even more complicated uh, in addition to this kind of skewed debate uh, about Europe. So why should people now uh, crossing the streets of my city in Torino, Italy, where I am, should, should, should register on that platform? And this is your point about the bite. And, and this will be the key point, meaning now for the first time, the EU made an effort to set up its own Facebook, let's put it that way. It is potentially transnational, there is an automatic translator, but so what? Why this time citizens should actually use this instrument? So overall, the feeling is that this instrument should have been invented probably 20 or 30 years ago, even before, even before Facebook, to actually enable citizens to have those conversations. 
but he, but he, he wasn't he wasn't there. Um, so the jury is still out, and it will be out for, for for a long time because, as you can see, we know very little about the, for, the platform. We know even less about the citizens' assembly, and we know nothing about all the rest and and, and the following up. So we're going to keep learning. Uh, but at the same time, let, let me remind you for the participants who are not following this so closely, for the listeners, that this exercise is set to last for around eight, nine months. So it would be very, very short. So I don't really see much of a coexistence among or between these three levels of the pyramid. So the institutional narrative is that the platform will keep going and will even transcend the conference, which is possible. But its real input would be now, because then the citizens' assembly will be taking over, and then their work will be picked up by the by the plenary. So there is a, a sequencing there, which is not necessarily what we all expected originally when we discussed about this two-year experience of consultation, exchange, and co-creation of policy ideas. So yeah, this is really work in progress. Let me also uh, steer uh, our, our discussion a little bit in a different direction, which I think um, ought to be perhaps the most important focus, but it doesn't seem to be. And that is, you already mentioned before that um, this conference is not supposed to engage with any kind of treaty change. It's not a mechanism that is part of the treaties or anything. Um, it might pre prepare the terrain. But in how, in, in, to what extent, in your view, and particularly also with regard to the arguments in your book, um, to what extent, according to you, ought or, or, or is success of the conference linked to uh, a deepening of integration? Or let's put it in other terms, at least a deepening of democratic possibilities of engagement of the citizens and a whole bunch of um, um, proposals already out there, like a permanent citizens' assembly that might be set up every six months or so. Um, people have been arguing for uh, changing uh, the Charter on Fundamental Rights. Uh, there have been uh, other arguments made around uh, access to justice, to judicial institutions from ordinary citizens, etc. And so, um, to what extent do you think the success of the conference is really related to the extent to which it can actually indicate such changes. Uh, one might say the opposite outcome might be just uh, a number of reflections on what ultimately is a status quo. And hence, again, it might not speak to citizens' minds, to citizens' imagination, uh, but it's set up uh, as such. The, the rhetoric is, is very strong in that regard, that it, that it will be a new, or perhaps even the first occasion for citizens to really uh, particip participate in the European process. So what's, your, what's your view there? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, the measure uh, the, of success of, of the conference won't necessarily be treaty change, yes or no. I, I always been critical of this idea. I don't think that treaty change is a, is, is a, is a realistic proxy uh, to, to understand or to determine the success of the conference. I rather think we should take a much a more sophisticated approach to it and realizing that this pyramid of participation is new and it might actually act as a Pandora's box by getting in uh, new ideas, new dynamics, new approaches that up until now were very much left into the hands of civil society groups that uh, try to create a transnational space. Uh, and we can think about many organizations, European Alternatives has been doing this work uh, for, for many years, now citizens take over Europe. I mean, these are all coalitions of, 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 of transnational events. I, I, I sit on the board of We Move, which is which is a, a online campaigning pan-European organization that has offices all across Europe, and it has really, you know, pushing citizens to engage with major policy decision by collecting signature and, and making sure the, those ideas, those preferences get to, to Brussels. So all these experiments of transnational conversations and pressures and influence will be institutionalized somehow through the Conference on the Future of Europe. And this is a very important change that will somehow reassess the participatory dynamics existing in Europe, will push some members of the European Parliament, possibly commissioners, to rethink the petition system, the public consultation, all these channels, and trying to see how this eight, nine months exercise might give some ideas, sparkles, 
in order to relaunch these participatory instruments. Um, this is basically what I expect uh, to, to happen. I don't expect millions of people to register on the platform. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I wish so. I would like so to see millions and millions of people to engage, but I don't think that the design, the appetite, I don't think is, is there for, for this to happen. But even though this time will remain as in the past, uh, think about the public consultation that preceded the, the, the uh, how is it called? Uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which was also civil society organization in 2001. Um, all these little avant-garde citizens organizations, still they contaminated European integration in the past. And this time will be the same. The contamination will be probably greater. There will be more actors, more voices. It is still too little. Uh, it is still too late, but, but it's happening. And for this, we need to praise the EU, or at least some of its leaders, who actually say that in full COVID era, uh, time of democratic erosion, rule of law uh, challenges all across Europe, getting worse every day. Well, the EU is launching a major democratic exercise. If you're cynical, you might say, well, they're doing it because they have no choice. But you can also say, but still, they could not do it. And COVID would provide a good excuse not to do it and to delay this. So I, I side on the optimist, uh, and I really think that this is an opportunity and remains an opportunity to unleash some of these dynamics. And final point, I think that the real proxy to measure the success of the conference will be how much of these dynamics and experiments, also in terms of modalities of participation, will remain part of the institutional architecture. So the institutionalization of a citizen's assembly accompany the European Parliament, perhaps, and the Council decisions, as it is already uh, experimented in, in, in Ireland. It, it is a reality in some communities in Belgium. I think this will be a good proxy for measuring the success of the conference. And it will be very difficult in 2024, ahead of the next European elections, for European political parties to be silent on those dynamics, on those ideas. They will need to position themselves on those priorities, even though they just come from a 0.05% of the population. And this is a bit uh, the interesting part, right? The fact that minority ideas and groups could actually be mainstreamed uh, and spoken out through this, this exercise. This is what I feel, Paul. Um, that's, that's extremely clear. Of course, I could play the devil's advocate and say, well, maybe it's too little too late. I mean, uh, some would argue the forces that try to undermine the European integration process, or at least, let's put it in, in, in more modest terms, a kind of renationalization, uh, a Europe of the nations, or whatever we want to call it, maybe they might be, uh, they might be too forceful, and, and, and these types of instruments might not uh, uh, stem the tide. I mean, um, uh, it's difficult to, to, to assess that right now. Um, I would suggest Let's now go into the um, more explicitly in the, into the Q and A session. And I'm, I'm gathering uh, uh, remarks by participants. There were uh, participants that already registered before and sent questions before actually uh, today's webinar. Um, I would first like to go into some more of the nitty gritty uh, type of uh, uh, um, dimensions to the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, for instance. Um, there's one question from Germany, um, from somebody who's interested in uh, uh, civil society participation in EU trade and investment negotiations. And so how might that uh, uh, be boosted? And might that in some ways also be related indeed to discussions uh, within the conference uh, on the future of Europe? There's a, another question that goes into a slightly uh, different direction by Maike uh, Geuns. Uh, I suppose she's from Belgium, um, uh, who mentions indeed this aspect of the profile uh, of the users participating. Isn't there a great risk of uh, selecting already the euro files? The, the people already know uh, what treaty change is, for instance, if you ask them. Uh, and so how could we uh, uh, make sure that we have a, a representative uh, a selection of European citizens, which include uh, exactly those that have so many problems with the European integration process, or that see it as a as a as a as a some kind of undermining of of national democracy and, and sovereignty. So, what are your takes on that? Perhaps in your book, for instance, there are uh, suggestions 
uh, that might help us think better first about this dimension of specific citizen participation in policy uh, making and in, in, in negotiations, uh, for instance, of free, free trade uh, uh, agreements. And secondly, this dimension of profiling of who is participating and how important is it to have people that are already pro-EU uh, participating in these exercises. Excellent question. Thank you. Let, let me start from the from the first one um, that uh, basically look at how public participation might become uh, a permanent input into the trade policy of the EU. And if you think about what happened over the last 10 years, it's pretty revolutionary, right? The EU has been concluding trade agreements with all of the world. Trade has been in its DNA forever. It has never been questioned by anybody. And then ACTA, uh, came in when the European Parliament for the first time exercised its new prerogative, newly acquired prerogative, of actually vetoing uh, a, a, a treaty that was already successfully negotiated and uh, green light by, by the member states. They actually, the Parliament has the last say. And this is what triggered then the TTIP conversation. So public participation occurred, but outside of the institutional channels. And then interesting that when the TTIP, the anti TTIP movement, mainly compact in Germany and others also in France, and there are a lot of literature on this. They try to register a European citizens, citizen initiative against it in order to stop TTIP. The Commission said, no way, we are not going to register it because the ECI does not allow to do it. And then, uh, interesting enough, the organizers of this uh, ECI, they challenged the decision before the General Court of the European Union that actually said, well, you know, the Commission was wrong. Uh, citizens can ask through an ECI not only the European Union to do things, to act, things or to reform, but also to stop uh, even a, a mandate they receive from the member states. This was a powerful, powerful judgment that I think I, it has not even been appealed by, by the, before the Court of Justice. So this is, this is good law. What, what does this say, this story? It says that clearly there is a case, um, and trade might be a wonderful illustration, uh, to show exactly the dynamic we were describing earlier together. So this idea of institutionalizing channels whereby the input from citizens does not only come in through the usual public consultation uh, at the preparatory stage, but actually kicks in and continues to accompany the negotiation in the same way uh, the negotiator, the chief negotiator uh, could be Barnier during Brexit, or he could have been uh, Mr. Bercero from DG Trade was reporting to the INTA, to the European Parliament uh, International Trade, and sometimes the plenary. Well, in the same way, it might be reporting to the Citizens' Assembly if it becomes a permanent feature, uh, so as to gather the sense uh, that uh, citizens might, might have, not only the representatives. Uh, so it's, it's, a good, it's a good case study. And on the second question, yes, I agree with, with the author of the, of the question. I, I've been the first one to say that there's a major pro-European bias uh, in the way in which this exercise has been designed. Um, at the same time, it's very difficult to think how to organize this differently. Uh, in the Citizens uh, Take Over Europe, we have been discussing for a long time where civil society organizations should be part of this exercise or should actually become independent and run their own exercise that would have a completely different legitimacy and in particular would reduce the entry barriers for negative, skeptical voices. At the end of the day, democracy is about having a public debate. It's not about informing people about what the institutions do. And here, there's always a risk that the institutions are telling people what they do, what they could do. It's all about competences. And this is exactly the logic that we need to, to, to break up. So again, unless this platform will be visited, will be participated by unusual voices, unconventional voices and groups and communities, uh, its, its value will be very limited. And that's why the citizens assembly might somehow offset uh, this reduced legitimacy by saying, well, these citizens are really coming from all over Europe. But this obviously methodologically remains a big question. How many of those citizens randomly selected will accept, uh, you know, not to suspend their life and to attend to those events? Well, it doesn't seem that it will be as cumbersome as in Ireland or in other experiments, but still, it won't be for everyone. Uh, so there are methodological, and there's a lot of literature, a lot of sophistication on how to actually make this work, but uh, to what extent the Citizens' Assembly might offset the limited uh, or skew uh, participation of platform remains an open question that I think we should, we should ask more and more. 
Wonderful. Um, I should also mention that in the in the in the chat, um, um, uh, Paloma Martin from the European Commission actually suggests us to look at an uh, ongoing research project which is called uh, Recreere. Uh, dot eu uh, which exactly investigates uh, these types of matters so that might be extremely interesting it also uh, makes me think about uh, we haven't really explicitly addressed this yet but the distinction between individual citizen participation uh, as uh, atoms you might say as as, as 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 people representing themselves in a way on the one hand and civil society um, organization participation on the other um, it seems in some ways that in this conference the second group is less uh, represented and so uh, uh, an issue that you might also want to uh, address um, is whether um, in some ways a randomly selected type of assembly is not in a way trying to steer away from other types uh, of participation for instance by by those that actually are are in a way filters intermediaries for citizens because they help them to understand how things work they help them to shape their ideas uh, so that's an important issue i think um well maybe i i just give you a minute to to reflect on that and then i will come back to you with a number of other questions because there's a lot of uh, a lot of questions coming in uh, at the moment yeah, very, very briefly on this, uh, absolutely the distinction between individual input and uh, civil society input into, uh, into the Conference on the Future of Europe remains, remains largely overlooked in terms of design. The platform seems to be designed really to collect individual input, but, uh, no, but nothing prevents uh, the uh, head, director, president of an NGO to actually participate. Um, but you're right, the focus remains on the citizen in the same way as the citizens' assemblies, by definition, will only entail the participation of citizens. And this uh, somehow seems to be um, the price to be paid uh, for not having organized civil society involved uh, in the plenary, uh, as originally discussed or debated. So the NGOs don't really fit into the current institutional design and unless they get in through the platform by organizing events, sharing their ideas, pushing their input, basically they will be out of, of the game, right? When it comes to the citizens' assembly and to the plenary itself, where only uh, basically, as I think, I, if I remember, as observer status, we see the, the business Europe and we see the, 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 the employees' organization. So, you know, this is very limited and not necessarily very representative. But this raises a, 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 br a broader issue about the representativeness or alleged representative of organized civil society, right? Uh, to what extent NGOs working or representing um, consumer groups uh, today or animal rights organizations or so forth and so on are representative of those. You know, this is a question that has been uh, characterizing the last 20 years, 25 years of, of debates uh, from the white paper on governance and the stakeholder conversation. How, how, how the EU could potentially, through an accreditation system like in the UN or other mechanisms, somehow uh, better qualify uh, who those interests are. In a nutshell, my take, and that's what I wrote in a recent uh, paper on, on the principle of equality, uh, by looking at the public consultation of the Commission, we always take for granted that equality is guaranteed in the same in the Conference of the Future of Europe. We start from the assumption that everybody has a chance to participate without moving uh, to substantive equality and asking, well, what else the institution should actually do to allow those uh, right to access uh, to be guaranteed? And, and this is what the EU is not doing enough, in my view. And, and my, interpre my interpretation of the principle of political equality would suggest that in a situation not only of the Conference on the Future of Europe, but day-to-day -day operation of the Union, the institution should actually do proactively much more to equalize access to power, to equalize access to, to the conversation. Uh, but this is certainly not, not happening yet, I would say, besides the funding to the usual NGOs that, again, are not necessarily representative. So these are all dilemmas that hopefully the conference will also raise in the coming months. It makes me think also of a di dimension that I find it's odd that it's not uh, brought up more often. That is, 
east-west distinctions mm -hmm. or north-south north distinctions. Uh, if we remember correctly, the, the, the Convention on the Future of Europe uh, didn't really involve uh, in a full-blown way uh, the new member states of the European Union. And so this might also be uh, currently uh, a nice occasion to, to rethink about, about what, what appears to be an increasing rupture, at least between some states in Central and Eastern Europe uh, and the, uh, the European integration project. But that's uh, just a remark um, uh, on the side. Uh, getting back to the uh, um, Q&A, the, the, the chat is pretty busy. Um, there's a remark by uh, uh, Dmitry Kochinov, who uh, we know uh, both very well and who's also part of the Reconnect project. And he indeed asks, uh, isn't it actually, isn't there a risk that the Conference on the Future of Europe might actually undermine uh, the EU's legitimacy rather than boosting it? Um, there's a, a similar question by uh, Jan Laros. Um, uh, who asked what is the risk that an avant-garde experiment with a platform will be perceived as part of a Europe for the elite uh, type of exercise. Uh, um, maybe we need a real European Facebook for citizens, daily life concerns, and not only institutionalized participation. Um, Rafael Drozeski uh, asks, how would it be possible to bring citizens who feel very far from these types of exercises to include them in the game? Uh, in particular in the pan-European citizens' assemblies. Um, and Nico, Nicolosi uh, Kajitze, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, asks a, a, a similar question. Do you think that the people who will register and participate will be mostly academics? <laughs> That's an interesting question as well. Um, so indeed, uh, summing up most of these questions, isn't there a risk of backfire, of actually creating less uh, civic legitimacy, social, sociological legitimacy, uh, rather than more? Uh, and that's an interesting question, of course. Well, to, to put it bluntly, I don't think it could get worse uh, th than it is today. So if you, if you look at this from this perspective, which I think is quite realistic, uh, you clearly see that this conference is, is very due, is long overdue, is, is more an opportunity and is certainly, certainly worth uh, risking on it and making a bet on it. And at the, same, at, the same, at the same time, as I said, there will always be critical counting the number of people who make inputs, but I don't think this is the right perspective. The right perspective, again, is what I was suggesting, is the kind of dynamics that this process, that although it will remain a process of the few, might trigger for the many. So a mainstreaming of ideas and how this Europeanization, which is so evident out there in the street, could potentially become part of the political space of Europe where Europeanization doesn't exist. Everything is debated at the national level in terms of politics. So I, I still think that uh, even if it undermine, if it will undermine partly the legitimacy of the EU as of today, it will be a, a bet uh, worth, worth taking. Uh, and in the longer term, uh, the EU has, has no choice. So it is really a unique chance to, to actually try to do something new, different, even though it doesn't look so good or doesn't look so new. Actually, it is different. And we need to acknowledge that uh, and, and perhaps try to abstain from immediately dismissing it as yet another failed attempt of the EU to talk to or talk at its citizens. Let, let's give it a chance. And then... In that sense, indeed, Daniela Vancic, who's also part of the uh, Citizens Takeover Europe uh, Coalition, asked what would be then um, a good f feedback mechanism uh, in those different layers you described so nicely of the pyramid. And also, I would say, beyond the pyramid, because the biggest question seems to me is exactly what is going to happen after? I mean, we've been mentioning uh, Ireland, for instance, uh, particularly in the second exercise of the Citizens' Assembly, there was already an, an, an understanding that this could lead to something, participation in, in the Irish deliberations, but because there had already been precedents um, of, uh, indeed, constitutional change. Um, so how, what should that look like, in your view? How could that be made more streamlined, perhaps, within the process itself, maybe also in the sense of a kind of through put mechanism, um, which also, I mean, uh, if we take the Irish case as perhaps one of the most interesting ones, there have also been critical voices regarding the Irish case as indeed being 
a closed uh, elitist ultimately exercise about which wider society actually didn't know much. Um, so these questions, of course, are really relevant also, I think, for the, the Conference on the Future of Europe. Yes, I think, Paul, obviously, on the feedback, we know very little. And uh, my impression is that at the moment, the only uh, link that has been uh, the object of the Commission thinking in particular on the platform is the, the, the way in which this AI system, AI-driven system will be selecting and also geolocalizing the concerns. So it will be very interesting to see you know where the concerns are and this somehow address the east-west divide or north or south it would be possible to geolocalize and to understand where certain concerns lie or to see whether they are spread all across europe that that's something new and and important but i think uh, on the feedback we need to make a step back and we actually need oversight on the feedback and i think that's where we should pay attention we need to find a way that we as civil society academic researchers all people interested in the process as much as in the outcome we be able to understand and to actually hold accountable the institutional design when they make any choice, any filtering. We need to be able to be aware of what's happening out there because if this automated report of the platform will say there are three major issues, climate, social issues, and public health, well, how, how, is there a way, will there be a way to somehow check how they reach such a result and there are issues you know very complicated issues of you know black box uh, algorithms and moderation how these occur what are the modalities and that's why there's a charter of value which has been put forward by the by the three institution which i think is very important but obviously it would need to go one step or two step further in order to be granular enough to allow watchdogs and i think we need to be watchdogs of the process in order to ensure that uh, these feedbacks will be explained to the public uh, it would be possible to hold accountable their, their used and actually to be able to reverse engineering how certain results have been reached. And this applies not only to the platform, it will also apply to the citizens' assembly, where, however, the conversation by definition will be much more, I would say, accessible and very pedagogical uh, because the media will be interested in knowing how these conversations are going. They will be covering them. Um, so there will be a different dynamic, a different dialectic that in the platform due to its digital dimension and the numbers at stake won't be necessarily be done. And then finally, uh, it became very political, the feedback at the last level, right? When the plenary session, we need to address the three institutions and by holding the pen and actually coming up with this, um, this will be very political and very politicized. But at the same time, for the first time ever, no European institution uh, receiving those recommendation will be able to say, well, I'm not competent to do so, right? The issue w w w at that point, at that stage, would have reached such a level of politicization that no institution could simply dismiss the issue as we cannot do it. No, at that level, you, can, you have to do it and you need to position yourself in relation to the result of the, of, the, of the conference. And that's why I remain optimistic because again, regardless how we get there, if we get there, something is going to happen. It will be impossible this time that the institution will just uh, turn a blind eye to the process and to the outcome and to the dynamics and the conversations that the media will be reporting about. And some political leaders, the braver or the most, uh, let's say, opportunistic, will be using as, as a positioning for their own parties. And remember that the European elections are not so far away and there's a lot in this policy cycle happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I remain optimistic on this. but. The watchdog idea, I think, should be should be thought through better um, in in the coming weeks and months, also by citizens take over Europe, and that's what we are discussing in the framework of the forum at the European University Institute. So, how we can have, act as an observatory of the process and the processes. I think that's that's an extremely important point, indeed. Also, the sort of the uh, counter democratic dimension of these types of exercises that would also bring us, by the way into a topic that we probably uh, need to address in a, in, a, in the next webinar uh, that is indeed what is the role of the uh, the non-institutionalized or less institutionalized indeed social uh, civil societal uh, sphere um, uh, we need to get closer to to an end but i just wanted to share uh, um, with you a remark by professor uh, uh, christina landfried who will be giving the third 
uh, a lecture, I guess, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, where she indeed uh, indicates also that there might be precedents. Uh, we might need to think more about what did we learn from uh, events in the past. There's, of course, a Convention on the Future of Europe that I already mentioned a number of times. But um, Professor Landfried also indicates, indeed, uh, the precedent of the conference uh, after the last convention uh, with the Citizens' Conferences in, in 2007. Uh, so that might may also make a, a lot of sense to um, um, uh, reflect on things that happened, like, for instance, in the plenary uh, of the convention, and indeed a kind of hyper-politicization at the end, where uh, participation became much uh, uh, less easy. Uh, so what are your views on that? How, how could we relate to those uh, prior experiences? Mm -hmm. No, no, no doubt, no doubt that all these experiences build one upon the other. Sometimes we get the feeling that no major learnings uh, have been made, but of course we we made some learnings along the way. And and I think uh, when people, in particular the media, present the conference on the future of Europe as yet another constitutional convention, they're clearly wrong because that's exactly what you have learned. We cannot do that any longer. We we need to address these participatory demand. We need to address this ethos that really asks for citizens to co-create and do things together. And the institutions, in their own way, they interpreted their zeitgeist by coming up with a framework that potentially show willingness to, to, to listen in a different way and to act in a different way. Again, we need to value this. Of course, it's too little and too late, but again, it is happening, and, and, and this is not something we should take for given. When you look at other regions of the world, when you look at other dynamics in the world, we, we need to be proud of it, but at the same time, extremely uh, critical and extremely uh, vigilant uh, in the way in which this process could be used, misused, instrumentalized by, by a variety of actors. Uh, and um, uh, our goal, I think the best service we could give and i think we can conclude on this note the best service we can give to europe and to the conference on the future of europe is to ensure that non-conventional voices skeptical voices uh anti-european voices will be part of this because only this will legitimize the, the experience and this is what european democracy should be about to be able to accommodate many more views and in a way, in the electoral process, this is happening, right? We no longer talk about uh, ETA Lexit, Frexit, and, and Paul Exit. Well, Paul Exit is a bit back on the, on the agenda over the last two days. But there has been somehow, I would say, an extension of the political space that allows the same European Parliament to accommodate many different voices that even shoot at Europe or Europe as it is today. This is, I think, the game, uh, making sure we can bring in or can persuade some people who believe uh, or don't believe in Europe as it is today to be part of that exercise in order to shape Europe as they want it. I think this is really the right angle we should take this exercise as opposed to saying, oh my God, we're going to have the skeptics, the skeptics uh, uh, logging in in, the, in this platform. Actually, they won't. And the challenge would be actually to bring them in in a way to have these conversations. That's an... Uh... I fully agree. I couldn't agree more with uh, with your remarks. It also uh, relates to uh, some of the remarks in the chat, like uh, Paloma Martin uh, uh, mentions the whole dimension of European identity, which is exactly uh, related to what you just said. How do we imagine uh, the future of a uh, uh, of our European project and a European uh, identification uh, with that project? Um, I'm afraid we really need to uh, wrap up. A Luckily, this was the kickoff uh, session to uh, what will be a, a stream of very interesting webinars. I thank you so much, uh, Alberto Alemano, for your really interesting uh, and, and useful insights uh, into issues of, of democratic participation in the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, I would like to uh, very much thank also all the participants and uh, particularly also those that have been extremely busy in the in the chat uh, and i just uh, would like to leave you with saying that the next uh, reconnect webinar on the conference of the future of europe will be the 10th of may uh, 4 p.m in the afternoon and it will be on the basis of our reconnect uh, research in this case uh, our uh, uh, team from the university of munster uh, will be uh, uh, addressing their research on 
uh, where they also have recently published a deliverable within our project called the, the ideal setting of the EU in the mind of European citizens. So really, this research is engaging with how uh, indeed um, uh, citizens think about Europe, what they want from Europe, how do they understand Europe, how do they, um, uh, what is their position indeed on the European Union. So thank you again uh, very much, and I'm sure this will. Uh, uh, continue in, in a very uh, fruitful and useful way. Thank you again. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Reconnect. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.